Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at Donatello's sculpture of David, uh, created for the Medici family to stand in the Medici Palace courtyard. So this is a really important sculpture for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a work that reveals a lot about the world in which it was made. Um, first of all, uh, one of the most important things about it is that this is the first full-size freestanding nude sculpture of the Renaissance. Uh, you know, artists had experimented with nudity in the past, they had experimented with uh, freestanding sculpture, but this is the uh, first that really brings together a lot of the things that had been lost in art since the classical period. Works like this had uh, were really common in the classical period. There were lots of freestanding nude sculptures, but they were really rare in the medieval period. And this is for a few reasons. Uh, you don't see a lot of uh, freestanding sculptures in the medieval period because of uh, because this is a, a very deeply religious time, um, and they took uh, one of the commandments um, from the Bible, the second commandment, which is one that is uh, that forbids the making and worshiping of graven images. Um, they took this commandment quite seriously in the medieval period and uh, because of this they were a bit suspicious of um, making sculptures at all. Uh, in the classical world you have a sort of long practice of worshipping images of gods um, and so for that reason uh, medieval Christians were, uh, were wary of uh, images of this kind. Um, we also have the nudity, which we will be coming back to in a little bit. The nudity is a really important part of this sculpture. Okay, so, um, but before we get to any of that, we want to talk about uh, what it is we're looking at, what the uh, sculpture is representing, and that is the biblical figure of David. As you should know by now from your reading, uh, David was uh, seen as a symbol of the city of Florence. Florence really identified themselves with this biblical figure. So he is a person from the Old Testament. He uh, would go on to become King David. Um, but in this story, he is a young shepherd. Um, it's not really specified in the Bible exactly how old he was meant to be. He's just described as young. So uh, it was really typical at the time for him to be represented as a young boy. Uh, but we'll see other images of David where he uh, is anywhere uh, up into his early 20s. Okay, so David is a young shepherd and he is the only person who is uh, brave enough and willing to uh, go up against the giant Goliath in battle. Um, and so what we're talking about is a classic underdog story. David is someone who uh, does not wear armor into battle, um, who uh, goes into battle knowing that he doesn't have the physical strength to defeat his, uh, his rival, um, but he has a faith in God. Um, and so he ends up uh, going into battle with his uh, rock and slingshot. He um, manages to knock out Goliath with the rock. Um, and then as Goliath is knocked out, he then uh, decapitates Goliath with his own sword. Um, and so uh, then we have David's side, the side of the Israelites, winning against Goliath's side, the side of the Philistines. Um, and this is exactly why Florence identifies with David. They are, they see themselves as, as underdogs, the underdogs of Italy. Um, Italy is a place that has lots of uh, um, much more powerful states uh, than Florence. Florence is just this little city-state. Um, and they're also quite proud of their status as a free uh, um, republic. This is one of the only places where you see representative government. Okay, so um, how do we know it's David when we look at this sculpture? This is one of the things we want to ask ourselves as we look at works of art. Um, you know, how are they identified? Um, how do we identify them? And how would people of the Renaissance, uh, looking at this for the first time, have known what the subject was? And uh, for a lot of works like this, what we're going to be looking for are attributes. Um, so David has a number of items that he's holding or that surround him that help to tell us uh, aspects of his story or remind us about aspects of his story. 
Um, so let's have a look at some of those. Uh, the first is we can see in one of his hands is a stone. Uh, we can see in his other hand the sword that he used to cut off the head of the giant. Um, and down at his feet, we can see the head of Goliath. Um, and what you'll notice is that the head of Goliath, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an important feature of this work, but it doesn't draw a ton of attention. We're going to see another example, or you have seen another example in your book, uh, where the head of Goliath plays a much larger role. Um, he's almost a more sympathetic figure. He's more humanized. Uh, that's really not the case so much in this one. Now, all of these are attributes. They help to identify David. Um, but beyond that, they help to tell the story. Um, and what they do is they tell you what point in the story we're looking at. Uh, because Goliath's head is clearly already chopped off, that tells us this is the end of the story. This is something that uh, you guys should really be thinking about whenever you're looking at a work of narrative art. Uh, you want to think about what point in the story am I looking at and what does the choice of the point in the story convey to you? Um, how does it sort of manipulate your emotions? What uh, are you meant to be thinking as you look at the work? Um, some works of art will uh, feature the climax of the story, the point in the story that's most exciting. It's sort of the part that uh, gets your heart pounding, gets you uh, really invested in what's going to happen next. How is it going to be resolved? Uh, this is a different point in the story. What we're looking at here is the end, and this is the point of resolution. It's a point of calm. Um, it's a point where uh, we, you know, we know that uh, there were these points of instability in the story, but now stability has been sort of reasserted. Um, and that's quite typical of these early Renaissance works. Uh, early Renaissance and high Renaissance artists really value stability and calm and balance. Um, and so this David really en encapsulates that idea. Okay, so um, now let's get to uh, one of the other really important aspects of this work, which is the nudity. Um, now, it certainly doesn't say in the uh, biblical story that David is naked. Um, it does say that he goes into battle without armor. Um, but Donatello has shown, has, has chosen to represent him naked. Uh, there are a few reasons um, that we can kind of think of for this. Um, that said, we don't know exactly what Donatello's motivation was. Uh, the first is um, that in some ways it does enhance our sense of the story. By showing Donatello, or by showing David naked, we are able to get this sense of his vulnerability. And that really heightens this idea of him as an underdog, that he is this truly vulnerable young boy going into battle against someone that he couldn't possibly defeat. And what that emphasizes is the miraculous aspect of this story, that David is has such strong faith in God um, that he goes into this battle with no protection. He puts all of his faith uh, into um, God's protection. Um, and and it rewards him in the end. God does bring him through this, this battle, this challenge. Um, the other way to look at this nudity is um, to look at this as a revival of classical nudity. Uh, as we've seen, a lot of the Italian Renaissance is about this revival of the classical past. That's what the Renaissance means. Uh, renaissance. This is the, the, a word that means rebirth. It's a rebirth of classical culture, classical thought, classical ideas. Um, and one of the really defining characteristics of classical art is the nudity. It's about the celebration of the beauty and perfection of the human body. It's about this ideal uh, human form. Now, for those of you who are familiar with classical art, um, I want you to look at the nudity here and, and uh, you know, ask yourself, does this seem classical? Uh, hopefully you guys all have had a chance to look at some examples of classical art, um, but I've also brought in an example here. So what we see here is um, a work by the Greek sculptor Polyclitus. And this is a work that was meant to uh, embody uh, sort of the idea of man perfected. Uh, this is a sculpture that is based on ideal 
ratios, ideal proportions, this is supposed to be a perfect man. Um, and what you'll notice in the Greek idea of the, the perfect man is that um, it's usually someone who is an athlete. Uh, typically, you're looking at someone who appears to be in their 20s, usually early 20s. And if we compare this one to Donatello's David, we see that uh, Donatello's David really doesn't fit the classical ideal. Donatello's David is far too young to fit that ideal. This is a boy who's, uh, you know, whose body really can't uh, put on the kind of muscle that we typically see in uh, classical Greek sculptures. Um, and part of this may have to do with simply the traditions of uh, how this story is usually represented. That David is not meant to rep is not meant to be someone in his twenties because, um, in a way that that undercuts, the idea that he's an under underdog. Um, it's he looks more vulnerable. He looks uh, the, uh, It's more impressive, um, to look at this young and weak looking David, um, having defeated this giant Goliath than it would be to look at a strong David um, having defeated this giant. Uh, so, you know, that, that could account for the youth of the figure. Um, but regardless, we do see this, uh, this attempt by Donatello to represent a, a nude figure. Um, it is idealized to some extent, even if it's not the classical ideal. Um, and we see a lot of other aspects that are uh, classical about this. Um, this interest in naturalism, uh, this interest in how the human body is actually shaped. If we look at the torso here, we can see that he has uh, represented the um, abdominals as if uh, um, you can see the muscle sort of pressing through the flesh. You can look at the arms and see that there is this soft fleshiness there. Um, same thing with the cheeks. Um, and really, most importantly, we have this position, this pose, um, that is known as contraposto. And you guys read about the contraposto in your textbook, but here it's, it's, um, is a good opportunity for us to take a look at what that actually means. So um, when typically when people stand... Uh, they're not resting their weight evenly between both legs. Um, their weight is going to shift more heavily in onto one. Uh, so we see that both of these figures are doing that. Um, in, in the case of both figures, they are resting uh, their weight on their right legs. Um, for us, it's their left. So we can see that their right legs are uh, rigid and straight. Um, they are the supporting legs. The other legs are there largely for balance. So you can see that they uh, are bent. Uh, we can see that here as well. Um, and that when we see this weight shift, this contraposto, it's not just about one leg being straight and the other bent. It's about all the ways that the rest of the body has to respond to this shift in weight. So um, the load-bearing leg uh, if we look at the hip for the load-bearing leg, the hip is raised um, while the other hip manages to dip. We see that uh, the opposite side of the torso uh, from the load-bearing leg um, sort of expands. It's, it is stretched out while the, um, the torso on the side of the load-bearing leg uh, is contracted. So we, what we get is this sort of twisting position, that the legs seem to twist one way and the torso seems to twist just slightly the opposite way. This is a really naturalistic position. This is a, this is a uh, position that you'll see in lots of paintings and sculptures that are trying to sort of imitate the way humans actually stand, the way humans actually move in the real world. Now this naturalism and the uh, emphasis on the human body, all of this is really representative of ideas that are uh, really brewing in the Quattrocento, um, this period of the 1400s. Um, this is sort of marking a shift in people's thinking about, um, about the world around them, about uh, their relationship to, um, to God and religion. Um, we talked about how in the medieval period, 
um, we have life really being dominated by religion, by the church, um, and that medieval art is really not naturalistic because it's meant to be more spiritual. Um, there is this idea that artists are not trying to recreate the world around them. They're trying to recreate this sense of a higher truth. Um, there's something otherworldly about medieval art. Renaissance art is, is sort of bringing things back onto the ground. Um, art is starting to look, artists are looking back at the world around them. They're trying to recreate sort of as closely as possible what they see. Um, though there is this element of idealizing, of making things look more perfect than how they look in real life. And um, this is not because they're turning away from religion. It's not because they are uh, less Christian or less faithful or less pious. Um, it's just, a, in a way, a different approach uh, to their Christianity. Um, and the logic for this for a lot of people is that, uh, that God in creating humans, uh, created, hi created humans in his own image. Um, and God must be beautiful, therefore humans must be beautiful. So there's no reason not to celebrate the beauty of the human body. And so uh, works of art like this do celebrate that beauty. Um, uh, works that uh, look at, at the natural world are celebrating all the, they're, they're celebrating the beauty of uh, God's creation in all of its diversity. Um, now, this we can see is a huge shift from the attitude towards nudity that we saw in uh, works like Giotto's work. Uh, most of the nudity we've seen so far in this class has been depictions of uh, people in hell. Um, nudity was associated with sin. It was associated with sexuality and, and punishment. Um, but here we're seeing nudity elevated. It is humans in their purest form as they're created by God. Okay, so um, that said, the nudity is still really bold. You do have these, uh, you know, certain Renaissance thinkers who are talking about this, who are saying that, that the human body should be celebrated, that it's beautiful. Um, but your average person um, is still not going to be comfortable with it. Um, and there are lots of people who are in positions of authority who would think that this is very inappropriate. Remember, this is really the first work of its kind uh, in this period. So um, then that, that begs the question, how did this get made? Um, and the reason that it's allowed to exist at all is that it's a private commission. This is not a work that was ever meant to be displayed in public. It's not meant to go out, out in the public square. It's not meant to be in City Hall. It's meant to be in the Medici's private palace. Um, and so, uh, as you guys should be aware from the reading, the Medici were a really powerful, really important family in the Renaissance. Um, they were really wealthy, uh, they were a family of bankers, and they were involved in lots of the most important commissions of the Renaissance. Um, and this is one of them. So, because this is a private commission, um, and because it's meant to uh, be viewed in a private place, um, we're able to see this artist uh, being more bold. Um, the, the Medici are able to, um, to, to give commissions to artists who are, who are willing to experiment um, in a way that might not really be the case when we're talking about public commissions, public works of art. Um, and that brings us back to the question of why David? Um, we talked about David being uh, represented here because David is a symbol of the city of Florence. Um, but this isn't a public commission. The city of Florence did not commission this depiction of David. Um, it's a private family, the Medici. So what does that say? Why did they commission David? Um, and what, one of the things we can pull from this is the uh, Medici family's sense of their own importance, um, the sense that they are identifying themselves with the city of Florence. Um, what they've done here is they have uh, essentially appropriated the city symbol, um, and in doing that, what we can kind of get from this is that they are saying, we are Florence. We are what makes 
Florence what it is. Um, so, you know, a very bold move. Um, again, partly acceptable because it is private, because it's not something they're displaying for all of Florence to see. So, um, in conclusion, we've uh, looked at a whole lot of aspects of David. Um, this is not a work that is going to directly connect to your uh, assignment for this week or to your, um, your test for this week, but keep David in mind because David is um, going to be a really popular subject for uh, artists um, of the next few centuries, and we're going to keep coming back to this subject. Um, and I want you to kind of think about how the depictions of David change over time and how the, how the ways that they change over time are reflective of the um, changes in society over time. Okay.